The battle lines are drawn. Unlikely alliances formed as MSPs clash on tax. As the budget was debated, Holyrood was divided. To tax or not to tax, as tempers flared over proposed cuts. It's fairly simple. How can you protect their income when they don't have a job? This is the government that's given public Enough sector workers a there. guarantee of no compulsory redundancies. That's what we've delivered for the people of this country. Cameron faces questions in the Commons on his Europe deal. It makes Britain better and stronger, he says. Too much sniping from the Tory backbenches. And the secret rocket why the Hebridean launch went unnoticed. Hello and welcome to the programme. Tax doesn't have to be taxing, said one advert from the revenue, but the issue weighed heavily on our MSPs this afternoon during the stage one budget debate. John Swinney, of course, rejected calls from Labour and the Lib Dems to raise income tax by one penny to mitigate his planned cuts. He said he was giving low-paid workers a pay rise, but the Conservatives were delighted about his stance on tax. Penny for your thoughts, unions protested about the budget settlement outside of Parliament. Inside, the Finance Secretary defended his plans in the wake of what he called Westminster cuts as he sought to protect incomes. The proposals to increase income tax by 1p next year will hit those taxpayers least able to pay. Of course it will. It puts up tax for the lowest weight paid people in our society. John Swinney also said he was raising the living wage for some 50,000 workers, but Labour said his cuts to councils would cost people dear. It's fairly simple. How can you protect their income when they don't have a job? This is the government that's given public Enough sector workers a there. guarantee of no compulsory redundancies. That's what we've delivered for the people of this country. The Labour theme was developed by their finance spokesperson. Let's use the powers we have, because faced with the choice of using our powers to invest in the future of Scotland or continuing Tory austerity, because that is exactly what he's doing. Labour kept insisting their £100 rebate for low earners who faced their tax hike was workable. Unlikely alliances were being formed in the chamber, with the Conservatives saying they stood shoulder to shoulder with the SNP against the so-called tax grabbers. To coin a phrase, presiding officer, we are happy to be better together with the SNP <laughs> on this issue. In the words of one tax grabber, the Liberal Democrat leader said Mr Swinney couldn't blame Westminster anymore. Every single cut to public services in Scotland is a John Swinney cut. He cannot shuck and he must accept it. He cannot point anywhere else anymore. The Greens' Patrick Harvey picked up partly on Mr Rennie's line of argument. And simply managing uh, cuts from Westminster and blaming a UK government, which is, to be fair, culpable for the deeply wrong and damaging actions that it's taking, it's not enough simply to know who to blame. Move to vote. Members should cast votes now. Labour's amendment to introduce the penny increase in this budget was, of course, dropped. But these arguments will dominate the election campaign. So, in our Edinburgh studio, I'm joined by a couple of parliamentary observers. Lindsay Bewes, who writes for the Press Association, and Severin Carell from The Guardian. Good evening to both of you. Thanks for joining mm -hmm. me. Um, Lindsay, to you, first of all, it seems the parties are taking very clear, distinct stances this time round. Yes, certainly. This uh, budget debate today felt like a warm-up act for the election with the parties setting out their stalls on taxation. Uh, Labour and the Liberal Democrats making a very clear pledge that they're going to add one penny onto the, the rate of income tax. Uh, in a way, it's easier for them to put that proposal forward because Labour knows that they're very far behind in the polls. They have uh, It's very unlikely that they're going to be elected into government. So it's almost easier for them to make that uh, pledge and to create this perception that they are the party that's, um, that's going to win over some left-wing voters with a, a pledge on taxation. And Sev, of course, as Lindsay's pointing out, Labour Lib Dems facing a terribly difficult election. Is this just a 
a, a last gasp attempt at gaining some traction here, do you think? No, I, I think for both the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party and indeed the Tories, this is actually a very, very important moment for them because what it allows them to do is to um, shake off and, you know, put back in the past the constitutional debate. They want to move back onto the agenda of what Hollywood is actually there to deliver, talk about the new powers and start reframing and resetting Scottish politics. So in a sense, it's also allowing them to adopt what are the traditional roles in old politics, if you like, Labour to the left of the SNP, Tories to the right and Lib Dems floating somewhere around the middle. Now, also, Dugdale, Kezia Dugdale, the Labour leader, does not think realistically she has a chance of winning in May, but what she does think she has to try and do is rebuild and reinvigorate and reunite Labour around some very clear, clear key central ideological positions and taxation in this model is one of those. She wants to unite the Labour Party, unite the Labour movement, and also primarily secure Labour's position on the left. She needs to make sure that the SNP and other left-wing organisations, say RISE, for instance, or perhaps even Tommy Sheridan Solidarity, I don't know, are, are not chipping away even slightly at those votes that are going to help secure the list seats that they need and maybe even save the odd constituency here or there. So, Lindsay, how would this impact on voters then? Some people have been speaking to you are suggesting that uh, it, perhaps Labour won't be able to attract people across uh, the, the union divide, as it were, people who are of the pro-SNP but attracted maybe to left-wing policy will, will go to rise. Well, I, I think it's interesting what Seb was saying there. I think uh, certainly there is this uh, this impetus from the, the unionist parties to get the agenda back onto uh, left and right politics and, and shake off this debate on the constitution. But I'm just not sure that that's going to be entirely possible. I think that the SNP has this core support. I think that that battleground for the, the, the left-wing voters isn't necessarily there anymore for Labour to fight over. I think that the constitution is still going to be a, a big issue in this election and I think Labour is going to find it very hard to persuade voters to come back to them when we know that voters actually uh, don't really go for tax rises. Most voters, the majority of voters, the polls tell us, don't want to pay more tax. So, Severin, I suppose the strategy for Labour, the Lib Dems, is they're trying to put pressure on the SNP. The Tories are, are loving this de depiction, I suppose, of, of being better together with the SNP, as Myrtle Fraser has said. Is there pressure on the SNP, do you think? Or do you think they can rely, as Lindsay's kind of pointing out here, on, on, on the, the, the nationalist bloc vote, as it were? Well, I, I, undoubtedly, John Swinney is going to be under significant pressure. Nicola Sturgeon's now going to be under pressure because from both left and right, they be, uh, they're effectively trying to put the Scottish National Party to proof about exactly how they're going to use the powers that are on offer and also about how they're going to properly animate their position that they are a truly progressive party. Now, the one thing, of course, is that where, where we are now, it's a convenient moment for Labour and the Lib Dems because they have the uh, space in the media to be able to set out their stalls and set out their positions. But they know fine well that John Swinney and Nicola Sturgeon are extremely adroit, clever politicians. They've also got the might of the Scottish Civil Service behind them. And John Swinney has already said that at some point in March, when the budget comes up for its final vote, he's going to set out his plans for what he would do with the 2017 uh, income tax powers. And at that point, we will see a much, right. much more engaged debate and discussion about precisely what you can do with the full tax powers coming down the line. Severin Carell, Lindsay Buse, thank you both very much for joining me. Thank you. Now, better and stronger, David Cameron says that's how Britain will be following his renegotiation of our EU membership. He insists he's happy to be judged, but judge they did. Pretty thin gruel, further watered down, was an offer, according to one backbencher. It's been a long slog for the Prime Minister. Suzanne Allen has been examining today's arguments. Cam's great EU gamble. Cameron's EU deal is a joke. Deal or no deal? David Cameron says, we, oui. yeah, see. Many of today's front pages say otherwise. Since the weekend, the Prime Minister has been locked away with Donald Tusk, President of the European Council, to try to hammer out a deal Mr Cameron thinks will persuade us to stay in the EU. He's confident real progress is being made in relation to the four areas he wants to renegotiate. Today, 
that was presented in Parliament. So if we stay, Britain will be in there, keeping a lid on the budget, protecting our rebate, stripping away unnecessary regulation and seeing through the commitments we have secured in this renegotiation, ensuring that Britain truly can have the best of both worlds. Then what we will never be. We will never be part of the Euro, never be part of Schengen, never be part of a European army, never be forced to, fail out, to bail out the Eurozone with our taxpayers' money and never be part of a European superstate. That is the prize on offer. Prime Minister's questions usually means verbal tennis with the Leader of the Opposition. Today, the long faces and clenched fists were as much from his own party than any other. Jeremy Corbyn seized on this. His negotiation in reality is a Tory party drama that's being played out in front of us as we see at the moment. The Labour Party is committed to keeping Britain in the European Union. Downing Street says ministers have agreed not to challenge Mr Cameron until he has secured a final deal. The Eurosceptics are hoping to land a big beast. On his way to Parliament, Boris Johnson was withering in his praise. I think the, the Prime Minister is making the best of a bad job. I think it's probably, probably more or less what I said yesterday, which is that um, most people looking at this will think there's a, a lot more to do. The First Ministers of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have written a joint letter to David Cameron calling on him not to hold the referendum in June. They say holding it so close to elections in the three countries would risk confusing issues. Angus Robertson raised that this morning. Today the First Ministers of Scotland, of Wales and of Northern Ireland have jointly called for a commitment by the UK Government not to hold the EU referendum in June, which would clash with elections to the devolved yeah, yeah. legislatures. Yeah, yeah. Will the Prime Minister give that commitment today? No date has yet been fixed for the referendum. At the European Parliament in Strasbourg, most leaders felt Europe was better united. Don't forget uh, what we really achieved. Where are we? So looking to the Minsk Agreement, <coughs> looking to the Iran deal, looking to the climate deal achieved in Paris recently. So the European strength is visible again and again. This is all leading up to crunch time, which is the summit in Brussels on the 18th and 19th of February. Suzanne Allen reporting there. Now with me for the Stronger In campaign is John Edward and in London, the Scottish organiser of Labour Leave, Nigel Griffiths. Good evening to both of you. Thanks for joining me. Uh, first of all, to you, John, we're hearing from Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Tory backbencher in the House of Commons today. Thin gruel, watered down even more. Why would people want to vote for this, to stay in the European Union? Well, remember, people won't be voting for this renegotiation when they vote. They'll be voting remain or leave. That simple. Um, the renegotiation was a, something that the Conservative Party wanted to do, and they've got what they think is uh, their four key points. But I mean, our point for the, for the broader campaign is that may convince you one way or the other, but there's a whole lot more um, that can, we can be doing with Europe if you, you stay in. The, the, the big question is the unknown quantity that lies outside that we haven't even heard about. But is this not the fundamental argument, though, this renegotiation changing our relationship with Europe? Because, I mean, we're probably pretty much well aware of what, what Europe does, but David Cameron is trying to say, look, you can get a better deal. So surely it is important for people well, to, when it's it comes important. to vote. I mean, those people who worry about things like political integration will see in the, in the report, the, the letter that came out yesterday, that says very clear, ever closer union will not lead to political integration. They'll see what it says about benefits, they'll see what it says about red tape and they'll see what it says about those countries that aren't in the euro being protected from bailouts and things like this. So if that's what matters to them, then great. But there's so much more in terms of security, in terms of safety, in terms of prosperity that Europe's about, which is what we'll actually be voting on come the referendum. Nigel Griffiths, according to John Edwards here, there's a long list of why the UK should stay in the European Union, adding on to what the Prime Minister has, has been renegotiating. I'm afraid I don't see it. When we're spending £50 million every day handing over to Brussels £19 billion a year, it's very important that we retain that money and use it effectively for our agricultural, our fishing, our manufacturing communities. Well, what do you make of the Prime Minister's negotiation, though? I mean, before he was going to, uh, going to Brussels, before he was getting that deal, did you think that he might get something that could change your, change your mind? Uh, I'm afraid I, I didn't, but I mean, he did promise sweeping reforms. 
we're getting no reforms at all on the common agricultural policy. We're getting very limited reforms, and it looks very, uh, very thin gruel on the benefits reforms that were promised, and in fact, really none of the sweeping reforms that are necessary. And it's quite wrong that something like the common agricultural policy, which is not allowed to help farmers in their time of need with the floods, neither help being given neither by the British government or the EU, they've got to go to their own insurers, it's quite wrong that it's gobbling up 40% of the budget and £43 billion pounds a year. Right. I've been, well, he I've been, I've been oh. hearing that's going to be reformed for the past 40 odd years. There, haven't, there hasn't been any effective reform of it. John, we, we hear all this, that things are going to be reformed, perhaps things don't really change, and when it comes to the UK's sovereignty, a lot of people out there, a lot of ordinary voters think, well, actually, we want our parliament to be, to be sovereign, the UK, the UK parliament to be sovereign. I, I think the trouble is that we don't ever talk about this enough. I mean, the very fact that you can say there's been no reform to the CAP after a massive multi-annual programme over the last 10 years just shows how little we actually concentrate on the details of this. Well, what does that mean? So I What's think that, that done for farmers? Well, I, 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 hang, on, hang on, Andrew, let, let them finish. And, and, you know, I mean, it's all very well to dismiss these, these, these renegotiations, but, of course, the, uh, the Leave side did welcome last year all four things that were delivered yesterday. So where we are is we've got this, this package. That's the trigger for the referendum. So let's start talking about the bigger issues that actually are all around Europe. And yes, of course, there's a contribution that every member state makes to, to Europe. But there's contributions we make to local government, Scottish Parliament, Westminster as well. And nobody questions what the point of that money is. The world is a complicated, difficult, frontierless place and we have to make sure our influence is as strong as possible at every possible level. So Nigel looking at that point taking on the big picture we're having these debates and discussions about quite technical arguments but John is saying look there's a there are bigger things at, at stake here when it comes to trade agreements perhaps we don't know what might happen if we do leave the European Union. Well in terms of trade our expanding trade has very much been outside the EU. The EU has been stagnating and in fact we used to export more than 50% of our goods to Europe, uh, to the EU rather, and uh, now it's down to 43%. We've got a trade deficit of about £62 billion pounds with Europe uh, and, and with the rest of the world we've got a trade surplus of £27 billion. So we're very good at creating jobs uh, in exports and exploiting markets that are outside the EU. Within the EU I'm afraid we We've got a, a stagnant picture and right. uh, of, of course far more jobs in the EU are dependent on their exports to the UK than we are dependent on our exports to them and that's why there'd be no trade retaliation because it would penalise German, French, Italian companies far more than it would penalise UK companies. John you're keen to react on that, no yeah. trade retaliation? Well I mean on the small point of trade the reason that the trade balance with the, uh, Europe has gone down is simply because the rest of the world has been developing quicker and, and so the trade we've done with them is still you know is growing all the time but that's still to say that out of half a billion people we do half of our trade with Europe. With the other six and a half billion of the world, we do the other half. So to pretend that somehow we're, right. Europe is a diminishing market is just to completely negate the fact that this is the single biggest trade area in the world. John Edward, Nigel Griffiths, thank you both very much for joining me. Thank you. Now, Scotland's race to space, not a phrase you hear every day, but a rocket from the Hebrides missile range in the Western Isles has become the first to be launched into space from UK soil. But the achievement, which happened last year, almost went unnoticed. Our science correspondent Kenneth MacDonald has this report. They're lengthening the airstrip at Ben Becula on the northern tip of South Uist in the Hebrides. Not a very big job in itself, but it's the start of a project which has raised a storm far beyond the shores of the Western Isles. In 1957, not everybody thought the Hebrides missile range was a great idea, but the UK government got its way. Almost 60 years later, last October to be precise, it finally took a small step into space. It was the military exercise that made history almost in passing. There was a large naval exercise run by NATO. And as part of that, they were doing some missile inter intercept operations. And so for the first time, they launched a missile from the kinetic operated range in Bembecular. And it went up and into space. So that's the first time any object has went into space from the UK. This is what it looked like. But there will be no place in a museum for the American-made rocket, because the point of the exercise was to blow it to bits over the North Atlantic. 
Nonetheless, a first for the UK and a first for the Hebrides missile range. That's where my family croft is, according to the family head history. So it'd be great to see some, some real spacecraft going up into orbit from Scotland. And that could happen soon. Prestwick, Campbelltown, Stornoway and Lukers are among the six sites vying to be the first UK spaceport. It would handle horizontal takeoffs like those offered by Virgin Galactic. So there could be space tourism up there and for the rest of us down on planet Earth. People will come to see space launches. And when anybody says, would somebody go to Mount Cranach to see a rocket launch? Well, people go to Cape Canaveral to see rockets launch. They even go to Roswell in New Mexico to look at a plastic alien because they're so interested in space. And half a million people go there every year just to go into a bar which has got a plastic alien in it. Scotland's space industry already supports 5,500 mostly highly skilled jobs. The first Scottish-built satellite, U-Cube 1, went into orbit in 2014 from Kazakhstan. So a vertical launch site here could bring benefits. If it takes a couple of weeks to get it to the launch site, because that's in South America, then that's a long time. So if we can build it in Glasgow and we can launch it from really close by, just by you know jumping in the car, going to the launch site, put it in the vehicle and get it into space within a couple of days, then you're really compressing that time. The new technology types of spaceship being developed um, mean that you don't have to find the kind of locations they used to use in the desert um, because you can actually be less weather dependent than they used to be for big space rockets. So when you've got systems like Elon Musk's new system, which is a reusable rocket that can land back on a pad, or the Virgin Galactic two systems that they are now developing, one which is an unmanned satellite launch from a 747, and the other one is Spaceship Two, which sadly had an accident two years ago, and they're now they're just about to complete the new one. These kind of systems actually mean that the British space industry doesn't have to go to Kazakhstan, French Guiana, or the west coast of the United States in order to launch a rocket. Kinetic, who run the Hebrides range for the MOD, say they have no plans to use it as a commercial spaceport, although they say they do have the expertise to support a spaceport anywhere in the UK. But in the annals of space exploration, there's already a new name alongside Canaveral, Baikonur and Woomera. Benbecula. Well, joining me now to discuss some of the day's news is Karen Lindsay, the editor of the online site Liberal Democrat Voice, and Ewan Crawford, the former SNP advisor. Good evening to both of you. Thanks for joining me. A couple of clips to play for you in just a, a second because the deadline for a new funding deal for Scotland has slipped. It was meant to be February the 12th. Now the UK government say the Lords will still be debating it on the 22nd. Labour aren't happy. According to the Scottish Government sources, agreement is as far off as it has ever been whilst the tone of the Secretary of State is to strain every sinew to get a deal. This was always the danger, that away from the spotlight, the two governments would fiddle and fixate and the momentum to reach a deal would be lost. I don't think in terms of self-imposed or arbitrary deadlines. Personally, keen as though I am to have a warm and supportive relationship with the Scottish Government, I've never felt the St Valentine's Day date had much relevance to this process. I'm willing to continue to work towards a deal as long as that takes and as long as we can. Now, you and the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, said he's still working towards a deal from the 12th. It's uh, speculation about speculation, isn't it? Yes, but the stakes are very, very high here. And although Ian Murray there was talking about um, fiddling and fixating, we're actually talking about huge sums of money. So this week you see Scottish politics dominated by a suggestion from Labour that they're going to raise tax, but actually that could be relatively insignificant compared with the sorts of sums of money that could be reduced from the Scottish budget unless a decent deal is done for Scotland. So that's why this is so important. Were you surprised at what David Mundell was saying? Did you think that he was heading for the, the 12th as well until he made that statement? Well, I mean, this is the, 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 the date that's important in order for the Scottish Parliament to consider uh, the bill before, uh, before dissolution and, and, and the election. So, um, you know, he clearly doesn't want to be seen from a Conservative point of view, again, to be putting up uh, roadblocks as the Conservatives have been seen to be done so far in the past. But it shows, again, just how important this is, that this deal has to be worked out because the sums of money are so big. 
Karen, do you think it is really important this deal is done before Holyrood dissolves for the uh, election? I mean, could could it be revisited after the, the May election? Well, I think it's in everybody's interest to really get it over and done with. I mean, it's not uh, a difficult thing to do if everyone just behaves like grown-ups, gets around the table and sorts it out. I mean, there, there are some kind of sort of eye-watering sums of money involved, certainly. Um, and we, ha we are seeing the same sort of brinksmanship from the, from the SNP, really, as we, as we did over the Scotland bill. Do you remember Alex Salmon's six red lines and John Swinney calling it a dog's breakfast? In the end of the day, they all voted for it. Uh, and you can see that tone as well, even at the, the, the Scottish Affairs Committee today, between Greg Hans, the government minister, talking about using the same sort of language as Mundell uh, uh, there, and Pete Wishart being, you know, less than uh, <laughs> friendly, I think. But, you know, let's just get it over and done with. You, and just briefly, and last point on this, do you think a deal was ever lightly? I mean, in some, in some ways, you know, you know, never the twain shall meet, perhaps.